Addis based ambassadors say GERD disagreements need to be solved in a diplomatic manner. And a scholar dubs conditions hit by EU on Ethiopia's election disappointing and unheard of before. Greetings everyone and a very warm welcome to Addis News Hour with the news I'm Shifaraulagom. Felix Tshisekedi, the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the current head of the African Union has arrived in Addis Ababa today. Sila Shibakala, Minister of Water, Irrigation and Energy of Ethiopia and State Minister for the Foreign Affairs of Ethiopia, Ambassador Burtukan Ayano have accorded a warm welcome to the President upon his arrival at Boli International Airport. The President visited Sudan and Egypt earlier to talk about the GERD negotiations. Moving on, in a pre press release issued on the proscription of TPLF and Shenia's terrorist organizations, the Attorney General says an organization can be designated as a terrorist organization if it fulfills uh, the alternative conditions set out under Article 19 of the proclamation. Accordingly, the first condition is that when a terrorist organization operates by carrying terrorist activities as its objective or the second condition if, is if the management or the decision-making body of an organization practices or officially accepts the crime of terrorism or leads its operation, or the crime defines the organization's nature through its operation and conduct, or most of its employees carry out its activities with knowledge of the crime. Although meeting just one above-mentioned requirement suffices to proscribe an organization as a terrorist, TPLF and Shane met all the three conditions. Therefore, the statement concludes they have been duly designated as a terrorist organization by the House of People's Representatives and are hereby considered proscribed organizations. Now, U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Jeffrey Feldman, held talks with Minister of Water, Irrigation and Energy, Selashi Baikala, and members of the Renaissance Dam Negotiation Team. During the meeting, the Minister of Water, Irrigation and Energy briefed Ethiopia's equitable access to the construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and the overall status of the tripartite negotiations. Addis-based ambassadors say GERD disagreements need to be solved in a diplomatic way under the auspices of AU-led negotiations. Demis Makura has spoken with Pakistani and Sahrawi Republic ambassadors concerning the ongoing disagreements on the second feeling of the GERD. Take a listen. Ethiopia plans to have the second feeling of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in the coming rainy season which mainly happens in July 2021. But downstream countries, Egypt and Sudan, are still expressing their anger, saying it is a direct threat to their national security. The countries went further and heard of saying they may enter into military deterrence to stop Ethiopia from having the second feeling. Pakistani ambassador Shozab Abbas, however, said this cannot be a solution. The ambassador expressed seeking diplomatic solution is the only amicable way to solve disagreements concerning the dam. Dam is already constructed there. Now it's a question of filling and delivering water, releasing operation of water. Uh, that would be settled down. I have a firm hope and conviction that it would be settled down between Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt very soon. But of course it's a difficult matter because everybody 
thinks that it is a matter of their survival. So if the stakes are higher, then the compromises should also be higher. It, it, it never happens that if you think about something which is very vital for the life, should be abandoned or withdrawn. No, no nation will withdraw it. But compromise would also be higher. Sahara Republic Ambassador Lemon Bale for his part said, concerning the feeling of a dam, all the three countries must accept the AU-led negotiation to reach into a final solution. The ambassador said his country, as a member of the African Union, works to support the finding of an African solution to an African problem. We follow this uh, subject closely. We follow it in uh, our bilateral relationship. We follow it on the level of African Union. And uh, we just hope that the uh, solution could, find, uh, could be found very quickly because Africa uh, cannot afford another conflict. We, we, believe in, uh, we believe in the political solution. And I think this uh, subject can be found, uh, I mean, its solution can be found in the, in the framework of African Union and so can found itself in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the implementation of African solution for African problem. Ethiopia retires its commitment for a genuine dialogue several times, but it is still unknown whether Egypt and Sudan have such a good face for negotiations. Ethiopia is the source of the Blue Nile and contributes over 85% of the Nile's stream flow. To this day, Egypt and Sudan are using 100% of the water, sticking to their 1959 colonial agreement between them. Not being signatories, Ethiopia and other upstream states do not recognize this agreement. Ethiopia is at the eve of completing the Great Renaissance Dam. Costing over 5 billion US dollars, that is being paid by ordinary Ethiopians. This dam will generate 5.1 gigawatt of power, and it is a non consumptive, eco friendly, existential necessity to millions. The three countries have been in dispute over the construction, filling, and operation of this dam. Even thought this dam provides major benefits to Sudan and Egypt in terms of reducing evaporation loss, silt sedimentation and unexpected flood. This dam is not just about generating power. It is a matter of survival for millions of Ethiopians who deserve a dignified life as their Egyptian counterparts. Welcome back. The former Sudanese irrigation minister Osman al Dun articulates that the GERD will create hydropower for the economic bloc of the region. Belligerent acts between the two sisterly countries do not help for a win-win solution. The former irrigation minister also said that any hydropower generation dam in Ethiopia is beneficial to Sudan. Gushum Aliso has compiled the story as follows. Egypt and Sudan have rejected several proposals by Ethiopia on the negotiation mechanism sticking on colonial water agreement as a reference point in legally binding agreement. The two countries are even looking for mediator other than observers over prolonged dispute dam. Ethiopia has already cleared its firm stance on equitable and reasonable water utilization without significant harm on the lower riparian countries. Despite Egypt and the Sudan stood against Ethiopia's stance, there are few scholars standing for fact. Former Sudanese Irrigation and Water Resource Minister articulated that the GERD will create hydropower and economic integration in the region. Economic integration mm -hmm. uh, between uh, the, the, at least between Sudan and Ethiopia and maybe in the future uh, Egypt can, uh, could be on board as well and possibly Eritrea itself uh, with the CSI authority coming in maybe they are thinking of something like that and um, um, most possibly even South Sudan. Then we can have what, what I used to call the Eastern Nile Economic Block. There is the potential there for and, and uh, the need 
uh, Ethiopia is in a very bad need for, for uh, food. Uh, food security. Mm. And Sudan is a very bad need in hydropower ge or uh, power generation as general. Yeah. So this is an area where those two countries could sit together and maybe think of this, uh, starting this initiative of uh, the Eastern Economic Bloc, uh, hopefully by the year 2030, uh, hopefully that will be on board. He elaborated that belligerent acts between the two sisterly countries do not help to aspire a win-win solution. The turmoil which is happening now should not disturb people. It is something Sahaba safe as we call it. It is just something passing by and it will, it will go away. But uh, those uh, the people in both countries are always friendly to each other and they have been, the, uh, Sudan has always been the, 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 the security for Ethiopia and uh, uh, a lot of help, uh, safe haven for people when they have problem there. So if, if this idea of the Eastern economic bloc was put as a vision or a dream or something like that, and people could go, uh, the governments could go towards that thinking, I think that would ho uh, solve the basic problem of food security, even economic security, even national security because people will, will be depending on each other and they will be caring about each other. Osman further explained that any hydropower generation dams in Ethiopia are beneficial to Sudan. Engineer Sairun Zain, uh, the late uh, Sairun Zain has done a lot of studies uh, when we were young. He was the Minister of Irrigation. Yes, okay. and at that time we joined him, myself and some other uh, young engineers at the time. And uh, the, the conclusion of that, uh, any hydropower generation dams in Ethiopia are beneficial to Sudan because they regulate the flow. Now, with the, uh, this is true for the GERD, and if the other three dams are built, that would be for the, for the benefit of Sudan. Osman suggested that operating dams at optimum level will help to reduce high amount of evaporating water at Hassan Dam in Egypt, but the constant flow of GERD will not remain stored. You don't need to store uh, a lot of water in all, all of our dams. We can operate our dams at a lower level, especially Rosaris uh, and Marawi. And even Jabalawliya, you don't need to store a lot of water in it because uh, of the high over evaporation there. And even in the high Aswan Dam, the high Aswan Dam, you don't need to reach the, the high levels. Now, the high Aswan Dam, the evaporation losses this year are 14 billion cubic meters because the level is very high. The other water resource expert, Rousseau Asafa, said there is sufficient water, but the three countries should discuss on efficient utilization of water among them. Still, for... for um Egypt that has a multi-year uh, reservoir, um, they are sitting on full reservoir. Um, so if you compare what Ethiopia is planning for summer, which is 13.5 billion cubic meter, there is more water actually evaporating from high Aswan Dam than that. In fact, yeah. combined, probably close to combined last year and this year. So to me, um, what they need to look at is that what is the best efficient way to utilize the resources. False narratives regarding the GERD by Egypt and Sudan will push the dispute over the GERD to a deadlock. Wrong narratives around the GERD and the Nile River. That is, mm, mm, that are mainly advanced by the, the other side. One funny thing is about the, the source of the Nile itself. As you know, 86% of this water emanates from Ethiopian highlands. Those forces, those sides are even lenient and hesitant to accept this reality. They, some of them advance a wrong narrative of the water perhaps emanating uh, from their border or from their territory. The other narrative, wrong narrative, is that Ethiopia is hesitant, Ethiopia is intransigent, Ethiopia is not willing. These are wrong narratives that are out to mislead the rest of the, the global community. And uh, these narratives are wrong narratives. Deal or no deal, Ethiopia is moving forward to achieve in the second filling of the dam in July. It was disclosed.
Now moving to other stories, the chairperson of the National Election Board of Ethiopia says proposals for reform should be mindful of factors such as timeliness, cost, complexity and transparency of the Ethiopian election. In response to a letter by United States Senators to the Special Envoy to the Horn of Africa, Ambassador Jeffrey Feldman, the chair, Burtukan Midexa, has pointed out that significant reforms at this stage in the electoral cycle are discouraged. Binia Malamayil takes it from here. Burtukan expressed her appreciation to the United States for its close attention and support to the democratic reforms underway in Ethiopia. The support received from the United States continues to be instrumental to the board, she said, adding the efforts also help to further establish the board as a professional, accountable and transparent electoral administration. She nevertheless said she found some comments in the letter unduly forceful, saying expectations must be calibrated in view of the broader environment. The chair reiterated that as an independent organization, the board is striving to implement the forthcoming elections at in a manner that is consistent with both the Ethiopian legal framework and international standards. Shortfalls, she said, are inevitable given factors such as population size, development deficits at all levels, a nascent democratic culture and an increasingly charged political and security environment. Measures are in place to minimize the effect of these factors on the ability of voters to cast their ballot, Burtukan said, adding expectations of all electoral stakeholders must be calibrated in consideration of the challenge faced. Electoral stakeholders have participated robustly in initial stages of the electoral process, according to the chair. The overall credibility and integrity of the electoral process relies in part on active participation of the electoral stakeholders. Political parties and candidates are playing an active role in the electoral process across the country, she said, adding the political parties face significant challenges. The board, she said, has made every effort to accommodate complaints or challenges from political parties when such complaints fall within the institution's remit. Several measures were introduced to meet international standards, Burtukan further said. Measures thus far include the integration of electoral stakeholders' feedback in electoral directives, procurement of new materials such as ballot boxes, screens, seals and indelible ink. Proposals for reform should be mindful of factors such as a timeliness, cost, complexity and transparency, according to Burtukan. For this reason, significant reforms at this stage in the electoral cycle are discouraged. Instead, the board encourages all stakeholders to adhere to the applicable codes of conduct and to follow the correct channels to resolve complaints. Now, a political scientist says the refusal of the EU election observation mission to send observers during Ethiopia's upcoming election, unless the preconditions it said are met, by the Ethiopian government violates Ethiopian territorial integrity. In an exclusive interview with ETV English, Brooke Basha also argues that the conditions set by the EU EOM are strange and disappointing. Uh, they come amidst efforts being made to make the upcoming election free and democratic. The story is presented as follows. The European Union observation mission has recently set two conditions if it was to observe the upcoming general elections in the East African nation. The government of Ethiopia has dubbed the preconditions surprising and unnecessary. In this regard, ETV approached the political science professor from Ohio University, Brooke Hailu Basha, to learn his take on the decision. Brooke recalls that the European Union has observed all the five elections, adding that he found it strange that the Union is setting tougher and uncalled-for conditions to observe this one. The EU, he said, has observed past controversial five elections, adding it should have been present now, given that Ethiopia is determined to show the whole world that it will hold free and fair election. In the last 30 years, 
they had made a commitment to attend or to 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 be present as an observer in in the in the five year uh, periodic elections of Ethiopia. Hmm. Uh, now, more than ever, really, the sixth Ethiopian federal election is a very decisive election because uh, the election takes place at a moment in time in Ethiopian political history where, quote unquote, free elections can be held hmm. and where um, an abundant number of political parties are going to take part. It was here that the European Union should have been present. The European Union, which always advocates and says that it stands for human rights, democracy and good governance, of course, uh, should have put their weight behind by being present uh, as an observer. Brooke also says the conditions set are not only disappointing, but also unheard of before. Uh, it is really bizarre. Why I say bizarre is that, you know, they should have been there, but they chose not to. Uh, secondly, uh, according to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson, Ambassador Dina Mufti, as all of us in the whole world have heard, they made certain conditions, you know, mm. to have their own visa you know, to be to bring with them. That's totally out of the loop of the Ethiopian telecommunication uh, uh, corporation. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, also, secondly, they wanted to also to uh, really announce the election result beforehand, before the Ethiopian Electoral Board Commission could, could announce. This is unheard of, unheard of, because imagine uh, the, the Ethiopian government uh, demanding to go to one of those European states to any of the 27 European Union member countries and also the European parliamentary elections, and then to demand uh, to put on to a condition saying that we need to observe that. This is unheard of. The political scientist, therefore, contends that the decision by the EU is tantamount to violating the territorial integrity of the East African nation. It opens the Pandora box of this, uh, you know, attitude plus argument saying that European countries have nothing else except to, you know, to look down at African countries and developing countries as in a state of neo-colonialism. It's a political concept, of course, mm. you know, always trying to be in control. I mean, uh, no country, no country in its sane mind, including the Ethiopian government, could really allow this because it is like interfering in the sovereign rights of Ethiopia. So uh, the Ethiopian government, I, I think, did a good thing. Brukailu has called on Ethiopians to take part in the election and show the whole world that they are capable of holding free and democratic elections in an unprecedented manner. The Addis Ababa city administration has hosted iftar dinner to the diplomatic community based in Addis Ababa, the political capital of Africa. The deputy mayor of the city, Adana Chabibi, said the iftar dinner enhances cooperation with the diplomatic communities. Kasan Chani presents the story filed by Demis McGraw. Allahu Akbar. The iftar dinner hosted by the Addis Ababa administration brought together a number of ambassadors based in Addis Ababa at Skylight Hotel. During the event, the deeds of the initiant Ethiopian king, Najash, who hosted the persecuted followers of Prophet Muhammad from Mecca, was praised as an icon of fraternity. Niger Ambassador Zakario Adam Maiga said Ethiopia has an aged Islamic history and having an iftar dinner in such a country makes him happy. This uh, iftar is very exceptional because uh, five years of permanence here is the first time that the city, the municipality of, uh, of uh, Addis invite us for uh, iftar. And as the mayor said, uh, Addis Ababa is uh, one of the main, the first uh, local, Islamic local. We, we know that uh, Bilal, Bilal has been here from before going to, to Mecca. And uh, from there, Bilal is the first, first museum of the Prophet. So the, this, uh, this iftar comes really very, very, uh, what to say, very, very uh, useful. This iftar is very useful and uh, it strengthens uh, relation between uh, the uh, diplomatic uh, corps and uh, this municipality.
Pakistani Ambassador Shuzawa Bas and Sahara Republic Ambassador Lamin Bali indicated that the Iftar hosted in Addis for the diplomatic community shows the solidarity between Christian and Islam followers in Ethiopia. The Emir of Addis Ababa for inviting me here for this dinner in Iftar dinner. And this shows the solidarity between the Muslims and Christians living together in this beautiful city. And uh, yes, it's a matter of great pride and great honor. We just have magnificent, magnificent iftar dinner uh, hosted by Lord Mayor of uh, Addis Ababa, which we appreciate. With, we thank so much, thank thank you so much for the magnificent invitation. We enjoyed it so much, and also we uh, really appreciate such kind of gesture during the Ramadan, uh, during this month, uh, Ramadan Karim. Deputy Mayor of Addis Ababa City Administration Adana Chebebe noted that the city is half of several diplomatic community members. Ethiopia, Addis Ababa is your common, your second home. This Iftar program is also to show our respect and our love for the diplomatic community. Uh, as earlier already mentioned by Ambassador Dina Mufti in Ethiopia, Islam and the Christian are living in a very cooperative brotherlyhood, respecting each other and celebrating uh, different holidays. Christians celebrate the holiday of Muslim, especially this Ramadan, Holy Ramadan uh, month. At the same time, Christians, not only uh, Christians, Muslim brothers and sisters also respect the holiday of Christian and celebrating together. Uh, we'll continue this with our diplomatic community, brothers and sisters. She reiterated that the Iftar Dina hosted for the diplomatic community is therefore a good gesture of the government to work more closely with the diplomats. Terrorist uh, Shane militants have killed an Oromia Broadcasting Network OBN's journalist. The Kalamulla Ganzon Police Department indicated. The late Sisai was returning from a wedding at 11 a.m. The police department told OBN that the perpetrators have been identified and further investigations are being carried out. According to OBN, Sisai was a dedicated journalist with a strong sense of public service and integrity. Now in business, the government of Ethiopia signed a grant financing agreement with the African Development Bank to support its effort to end stunting and malnourishment of children in Ethiopia. The grant agreement, which amounts to over 31 million USD, was signed during a ceremony held in the Ministry of Finance and will be used to support nutrition-specific interventions including the building of infrastructure to support nutrition programs implemented in various parts of the country. During the signing ceremony, Yasmin Wahabrebi, State Minister of Finance of Ethiopia, said this grant agreement will support the implementation of Sakota Declaration, in which Ethiopia has shown its high-level commitment to end child malnutrition in the country. Moving on, Turkish ambassador to Ethiopia, Yapra Kav, says Ethiopia is a number one choice for Turkish investors. Ethiopia is a country where Turkey invests the most in sub-Saharan region. About 250 Turkish companies are currently investing in Ethiopia, according to the ambassador. And Turkish investment is swiftly growing, she said. Turkey is currently uh, the number two investor in Ethiopia after China. Uh, we have 2.5 billion US dollars of investment 
and uh, Ethiopia is the country in sub-Saharan Africa where Turkey invests the most. Again, Ethiopia is number one, as I told you, for Turkey. Um, these investments, just to show how fast it happened, in 2005 there were only three Turkish companies. In 2021 there are 250 Turkish companies. So in a matter of 16 years, the, invest, the number of companies increased by 245. Uh, that is huge. Of course, the aim of Turkey is to continue this, uh, to continue this investment in Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is another home for Turkish investors, the ambassador said, noting that investors from Turkey are enjoying the business climate. Takalsen. Well, Turkish investors, as I said, have been here since around 2005. Uh, they, uh, when I talk to them, they tell me they're now almost Ethiopian. So they're both Ethiopian investors and Turkish investors. That's the way we should look at them. They feel they are a part of this community with its problems or with its advantages in good times, in bad times. They feel they are part of this country. Uh, they bring technical know-how to this country. They bring vocational training. Uh, they bring uh, foreign currency with the exports that they do. Uh, they do lots of humanitarian work around their companies in the towns in which they function. So these companies don't feel that, oh, when something is going wrong, when something is difficult, let me leave. They are, Turkish investors are not like that. That's what makes Turkish investors different. When there were other problems, such as uh, energy issues, uh, security issues before, they always found ways to overcome these problems. They are very creative people. That's the way they did it. The Turkish embassy in Addis is currently working with the Ethiopian government to solve certain problems faced by Turkish investors. Turkey's wish is for them to be here, to stay as a part of Ethiopia. They wish to stay here as a part of Ethiopia. They are facing certain problems right now, uh, but we are working very hard with the Ethiopian government, with a very friendly Ethiopian government, to overcome these problems, and I'm sure we will, because uh, the, it really is a huge advantage to have these companies here for both sides. Now, in our continental news, South Sudan's President Salva Kiir has dissolved parliament. The move is in line with the peace deal signed three years ago, which states that almost a quarter of the members of the parliament would come from the party of Rik Machar. Whatever the dissolved parliament has been doing has not been binding on other parties because of the majority of the parliament belongs to President Salva Kiir, and some opposition parties are also affiliate, affiliated to President Salva Kiir. CGT in Africa reported that one of the tasks this parliament will be to make sure a budget 
is passed for newly established ministries and to make sure that other sectors that were supposed to be reformed according to the PCDL. Finally, a quick reminder of the top stories. Addis based ambassadors say GERD disagreements need to be solved in a diplomatic manner. And scholar dubs conditions it by the EU on Ethiopia's election disappointing and unheard of before. And with that, we come to the end of this news edition. Many thanks for watching us. Bye-bye.